four of these DRGs are actually related to head injuries. So uh, fortunately we've got a, a neurosurgeon here who uh, can support that and, and they're probably I guess our uh, busiest uh, group within the uh, the trauma service and I'd like to acknowledge Mark Fitzgerald who lent me these slides which was from the latest trauma audit. He's the Director of Trauma Services at the, uh, at the Alfred. You can see there though that there's a lot of spinal injuries that come into this. So if we go to your typical patient who might fall off something and this is a 68 year old male who fell off a balcony. Unfortunately his big hat didn't uh, help um, save him from the fact that he had a little bleed here contra coup injury here and as you can see he broke every uh, rib in his uh, rib cage and ended up with a big flail segment there. Um, and as I said that um, head injury is the most common injury you're going to see uh, from this and it's the most common cause of uh, death. Um, however for this patient um, certainly it was his chest rather than his head injury uh, that was the major uh, concern all along. If we look at these patients with uh, major trauma and you can see um, I guess the spread of different injuries that they, um, that they have here and you can also see for us as orthopaedic surgeons it generates um, quite a lot of work in the upper limb and also both in the lower limb and these are the figures for the last financial year of patients presenting uh, to the Alfred. And as for the spine that's a, a growing group and it's only just recently we've managed to I guess be a bit better at, at getting together some of the numbers and you can see that 90 of these patients um, with very few I might add having spinal cord injury um, require surgery um, and nearly um, 200 of them require at least some sort of uh, treatment or orthoses. And back to our 68 year old male who fell off a balcony, well surprise surprise he also had a uh, a spine injury and this looks fairly innocuous doesn't it? But at 68 uh, once he sits up unfortunately uh, although he was always planned uh, for a brace the osteoporosis kicks in and uh, then you have that collapse and for those who didn't see this, this is of course is a burst fracture which you can tell because it involves the middle column there. So what to do um, about this and I guess this is my sort of personal algorithm for how I think about treating uh, spinal injuries and it's really all about the stability and unfortunately we don't have anything much better that helps us uh, with determining the stability uh, than these sort of um, vague terms which range from stable to unstable and now unfortunately MRI has made this uh, in fact a little bit more hazy. So what was done for this 68 year old man who uh, fell off a balcony? Well his chest uh, remained the major concern um, and so again thanks to Greg Etherington, uh, my colleague at the Alfred who treated um, this patient and this is what he did which is a pretty stock standard uh, treatment for a burst fracture in somebody who has uh, multiple injuries. So um, I guess this all did um, fall came into I guess prominence in the early 2000s as a significant cause of injury and, and um, this paper came out, uh, Jamie Hendry uh, who was the Director of Emergency uh, spearheaded this at the, um, at the Austin and uh, uh, recognised an increasing uh, trend. And what are the sort of injuries that we seem to see? Well the most common one I see these days of course is the uh, compression or crush fracture. Now this is a so-called stable injury because it's less than one column. As you see it affects the um, anterior column uh, but you can tell it's not a burst fracture because it doesn't exit anywhere uh, through the middle column. And if you contrast this to a burst fracture um, which everybody should recognise um, as something that's unstable because it's two or more columns and in this case it, it does affect the third column, the posterior column here. But a burst fracture of course can be as simple as a sagittal split um, that disrupts the middle uh, column here and by definition they're unstable and of course you've got that continuum um, within this stable group uh, of uh, stable unstable fractures and unstable unstable fractures to coin I guess a typical orthopaedic uh, way of putting things. And so how do we treat them? Well 
I guess we've come a long way in being able to, I guess, formally have algorithms for this and take the mystique out of summer spinal surgery. And I guess Alex Beccaro, um got together this group in the, uh, um, the uh, Scoliosis Research Society in the States and was able to actually put it all down on paper. And now you can actually score these injuries and get a good idea of whether you're treating them right. However, you'll notice that it doesn't, um, although it does take into account the injury morphology, the ligamentous uh, complex and the neurology, it doesn't say anything about multiple injuries or osteoporosis, which these days um, do affect things. For that last patient, how did I treat it? Well, anybody who knows me knows that um, I'm a big proponent of the anterior uh, approach. And this is another way of treating the burst fracture and certainly, I think, a better way of decompressing that fragment that you saw um, in the canal. However, we could spend another hour talking about the pros and cons of different approaches for, for burst fractures. What about in the neck? What do we see in the neck? Well, I guess this is the commonest um, scenario. However, um, a lot of our patients nowadays have uh, much more degenerative change uh, in the neck, but as you see, a, a normal uh, CT scan, a normal uh, T1 weighted MRI. However, you look at the other um, views of the MRI, we've got the T2 up here, we've got the STIR, which is the one I usually like to look at for soft tissue injuries. You can't see much on that, but not until we look at the, um, the PD fat sat that we see they've actually got significant bruising in the subcutaneous uh, tissues here. And if we look at a more common uh, scenario of what we call whiplash, uh, you can see we're, we're seeing lots of MRIs, uh, which are uh, normal um, in, in the bone, as you see on the CT, uh, but they have this um, edema area. What does it mean? How unstable um, is it? Um, I think that's what's causing a lot of confusion uh, these days when we come and uh, try and clear the spine. Now I know spinal clearance came up quite a number of years ago when I was on the uh, State Trauma Committee and I know Doug Brown, who's the Director of the Cord Service at the Austin, wandered up to me one day and just said, well, you know, tell me about how you clear the spine. And so I guess this is a, a couple of drafts further on, but this is what I sort of made for him which he eventually took to the uh, State Trauma Committee, which evolved into this, uh, I guess, guideline uh, for being able to clear the spine. And the, I guess, good thing about this is this can be adapted for any hospital um, according to whatever facilities um, they have. So what are the actual, um, I guess, injuries per se that we commonly see from these um, falls? Well, this is a common scenario, degenerative spine, you can see here, and spinal canal stenosis. Um, and um, what we've got here is actually some cord edema and a cord injury because this is a very common extension injury, central cord syndrome, this whole conglomerate that uh, occurs uh, just simply because we're getting older um, patients who have degenerative changes in their spine um, injuring themselves. You can also see here a little bit of um, increased signal in the um, disc here, and that's, I guess, a, a disc disruption. And again, um, it sometimes can be difficult to determine how unstable um, these patients are and whether they need surgery or will be best uh, treated in a brace because now you're starting to get into the uh, realm of where patients have um, quite a lot of comorbidities. Another patient with... Um, degenerative changes who uh, had a fall. Um, this is a good illustrative um, x-ray um, or CT scan simply because it demonstrates two injuries, the second of which you can't see, but as you know, the type 2 dens, a very, very common injury in elderly patients with um, low velocity um, injury. And then, of course, you see this patient here with um, DISH. And in another cut, he's actually got a fracture through the osteophyte um, as well. And by and large, um, these patients do very well in, um, in a halothoracic uh, brace. And just as a side, just a reminder that uh, um, we are getting, I guess, more people with DISH, which you see on the right, and the difference between DISH and ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and I guess for the trainees, just to point out, if you look at the SI joints, okay, because in ankylosing spondylitis, the SI joints must be fused, 
and also if you look to see um, the way the um, fusion occurs up the spine, ankylosing spondylitis must be contiguous. It's, it starts in the SI joint and works its way up the spine and DISH will give you uh, skip lesion. But important to recognise these because as you know from your biomechanics it leaves you with a very stiff spine which means you've got um, long, um, long lever arms and so any patient who has these conditions you must assume after um, a significant fall that they've got a fracture until proven otherwise. And again this is I guess translating the way I think about things with um, stability into how I, um, I treat them. And of course Alex um, again uh, got a cervical spine group together and now it's all very well documented as to um, how, we should, how we should treat them. Uh, but you notice that uh, the integrity of the disco-ligamentous complex with these patients is, is probably not so significant. Very easy to pick people's papers to, to bits after the fact, isn't it? Um, and there's the um, slick uh, classification there. Uh, again, you see it's divided into morphology, uh, the ligamentous structures and the neurological status. And um, don't get me wrong, the TLIX and the slick classifications are very, very um, useful tools into... Uh, reassuring you as to you know whether you are uh, providing a reasonable sort of treatment uh, for this patient. So we've we've come a long way, um, I guess, since Hippocrates, who I guess devised the first therapeutic ladder, and this is what he used for spinal cord injuries. He hung them upside down and uh, had a few helpers to shake the ladder um, in the hope of shaking everything back into uh, place. But unfortunately, this didn't. Uh, get very far. So I guess have we come a long way? Um, we're still falling off things. Um, and I guess this is a fairly recent x-ray, uh, sorry, picture. Um, and I guess we're perhaps using the ladder uh, for different things and in different ways these days. So you can't um, fault his ingenuity. Um, but certainly I think an accident <laughs> waiting to happen here. <laughs> So he was probably an orthopaedic surgeon, by the way. He, uh, um, I guess, set that up. Um, so this study actually came out of the Alfred Hospital uh, Emergency Department, and you can see the huge numbers um, of people that it affects. Um, certainly, um, in relative terms, major trauma, fortunately, um, isn't that common. But as you can see from the, the previous um, slides that I showed you, it's still you know a significant amount of... Um, I guess injuries that, uh, that, that need to be uh, treated. And I guess the interesting uh, thing is, of course, you know, middle-aged to elderly patients undertaking unpaid work for this increase. And I think um, this is what we're seeing probably as a bit of an academic. So I guess are we treating our spinal patients uh, right? And again, thanks to Jin T, who's a neurosurgical fellow at the um, Alfred, who's undertaken... Um, He's undertaking his, his MD at the moment and looking at a couple um, of these um, issues in, in spine. And he looked at 104 patients to see how well we uh, were treating them. And it seems we're not doing too badly at 93% and 96% compliance with those um, algorithms. As you can see, the, vast, um, the majority of them are thoracolumbar fractures, those compression and burst fractures. And who are the patients that are getting these uh, injuries? Well, the, the, I guess, novel thing that he has found is that we're getting this peak of 46 to 55-year-old, uh, predominantly males, who are at risk from these full um, injury. And there you can see it depicted on a bar graph. Um, and I think it's a bit of a worldwide epidemic. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the ASEAN Travelling Fellowship and over in Indonesia uh, speaking to um, Dr Poe and this uh, spine surgeon, uh, he calls them the holiday fractures and certainly uh, for them uh, these injuries are getting much, uh, much more common than uh, car accidents for causing spinal injuries. And if we just have a look at I guess our, um, our own cohort of where we sit uh, in the age bracket there, and you can see that the red outlined uh, numbers where most of us uh, sit in that age group fall 
into a pretty good age uh, distribution of uh, these risks for fall. Um, so just I get, I guess, a bit of food for thought and, and this is my, I guess, current, current concepts in spine fracture. If you're a 46 to 55 year old ma male, okay, which I, a number of you in here will fall into, please don't climb up ladders. Uh, but if you're going to fall, hopefully somebody in this audience has uh, realised that there is a, a systematic way of clearing uh, the spine and hopefully you don't have osteoporosis, uh, degenerative canal stenosis, uh, dish or ankylosing uh, spondylitis um, that is going to make you more liable to having a spinal injury. So um, thank you very much. Just a few random thoughts on spine. Thank you.